Hi friends, we are live and today with a special guest, Robert Scobel, a futurist and chief strategist at Infinite uh, Retina. Uh, Robert, welcome to my channel. Hey, thanks for having me on. It's been a while since we hung out in Germany. Yes, time time flies, man, time flies. But uh, yeah, today I would love to talk about uh, all things AI, Tesla, chatbots, uh, whatever, I think um, all of the good stuff. So uh, yeah, let's maybe start with um, what are you most excited about currently? Yeah, <laughs> if I said anything other than AI, everybody would be like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, GPT-4 is still causing massive change to the world and will be for a long time. Um, uh, and then there's 3,000 other tools on top of that that are all AI-based. So this new large language model uh, that GPT is using underneath it, it is it's quite something. It's a machine with a trillion knobs, the way I put it the other day. And we're all trying to figure out you know, what knob to turn. And what does it do when you turn that knob, you know, and the way you turn the knob is talk English to it. Right? <laughs> you know? so, yeah, not, not only English, right? Also many other languages language. and images and whatever, right? No, any language. You could talk to it in German, right? It understands that. It understands Japanese. It understands all sorts of human languages, right? And it understands programming languages, too. <laughs> so you Absolutely. You can copy in a spreadsheet into chat GPT and ask it, hey, flip flip the comms and rows around, right? Just with English and it does, right? It's like, whoa. So what are it the coolest... Lego format. It, it speaks Lego. It speaks a lot wow. of things. <laughs> <laughs> so what are some of the coolest uh, applications or prompts or, or yeah, uh, things uh, you, you saw? Hard, prompts are a hard one. I, I was at the hackathon uh, GPT uh, for plug in hackathon and the prompts that they're doing often are you know this long very dense with a lot of setting of uh, context and and giving it detail to know what to do right and uh, i just shared in fact a guy uh, did a pr pretty good prompt engineering guide uh, this morning and i just retweeted that and so yeah that's the kind of prompts that people that the high end is doing Normal people haven't even heard about it yet, right? <laughs> I mean, my brother just got on it two days ago, and he's my brother, right? He's not somebody who doesn't have a Silicon Valley, you know, tech connection to keep bothering him about uh, trying a new thing. But he just got on it. Um, and beginning users, you know, they tend to try to use it like they use Google, you know, give it a few words and see what comes back. And it does pretty good with very sparse data, right? But it starts getting better if you start moving toward more complex prompting. Um, when you figure out this machine has a trillion knobs and you have to put prod it and push it a little bit to give it better information and get, get it to do things for you. Um, you know, that, that's when you know you're an advanced user when you're doing some of these prompt engineering tricks. But even, even simple stuff, start talking to it have a conversation with it. It talks to you, right? And the more you talk to it, the more it it gets to what you want, right? Um, and then, you know, you can start layering on more and more information into your props. You know, hey, show me, uh, uh, you know, tell me what to eat at this restaurant from the vegetarian point of view, right? Most people don't think of adding the vegetarian point of view because they don't know it can remix everything like that, right? So... It's a fun, oh. it's a fun mm -hmm. engine to play with. I mean, people are, everybody's figuring it out, right? Even the bleeding edge people, they're, they're a few steps ahead of us, but you know, they're not that far. They're a month ahead of us. Right? <laughs> you know, so. Yeah. I feel personally, I'm, I'm not as creative. I'm, I'm discovering every day new, new things, but um, yeah. yeah. What, what, what are you using it personally for, or are you just playing with it or? No, I'm, I'm trying to, for, I, I noticed that there's people who use AI first, right? Mm. And and the Tesla fits into this, right? I when I get in my Tesla, I turn on the AI before I try to learn, before I try to drive, because it's better at driving most of the time than I am. And me watching it drive, 
I can over, always overtake it, you know, always turn it off and get get it involved in driving again. Um, but it does pretty good. It's much better than I am at a lot of things, right? Absolutely. And how do you how do you see the the landscape? Uh, yesterday, the the Tucker Carson uh, interview came out uh, yeah. where Elon talked about OpenAI, uh, where he is pretty dissatisfied with the whole. Uh, yeah, um, closing down and and going private and a Microsoft uh, situation and now he's talking about uh, creating an, an alternative himself, a third one. Uh, yeah. So how do you see this whole landscape with? Um... Oh, there'll be more too. I mean, I, you know, he's not the only one who. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was talking to a guy at Google on on Sunday, and he was like, "Ah, we're going to come with a lot of stuff, and we have." A huge advantage that some other companies don't have they make their own ai chips right M microsoft just this morning leaked that they're working on their own ai chip because they don't want they can't buy buy enough nvidia cards right hmm. and and they can't optimize them for their workflows right um and, and get them cheap enough so everybody is uh, you know tired of paying the nvidia tax and waiting in line for a100 cards i mean if you wanted to buy a million a100 cards even if you had the billion dollars you, you got to wait in line for them right now so everybody is uh struggling to get enough cards to make these models and and do the work that the advanced people are doing I, way over my pay grade the people who are actually creating these large language models or these ais right and so how, how do you how do you see the, the landscape uh, currently who are the big players or or who is coming up uh, how, how do you how do you see the whole landscape right now it, uh, chat gpt has completely changed the game and because microsoft invested i think what 29 billion dollars in open ai and and uh, microsoft and other uh, a lot of others have integrated open ai chat gpt into their products right microsoft is building this into all of its office apps and dynamics and other things right and so that's that distribution is real interesting the oxygen too has completely disappeared for anything that's not ai i mean if you try to announce something that's not ai right now nobody's going to pay attention to you you know unless you use ai somehow you know i mean you know just the way things are right now i'm watching twitter why would we speak and it's all ai 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 right um and so if you're a strategist at apple you you got to be concerned about this because you you don't have uh you don't have a ai that really matters right now could they build one you know, I never vote against the company with two hundred fifty billion dollars in the bank, right? But right now, they they are not really relevant, right? Apple or or what? What are they doing currently? Well, in AI? relevance is a funny thing. <laughs> yeah, uh, today Siri. In fact, I'm interviewing the founders of Siri next week in Tennessee about about Siri and where we where we are with voice. Um, Siri is built on AI 1.0 right it was the first consumer app that i know of uh that used ai uh in it in its how it works underneath uh but that was a very inflexible ai it's nothing like chat gpt where it understands everything you tr can ask it right I, I mean i met with an oil man in texas and asked him what, what's your challenges oh cleaning out oil tanks on oil on this kind of oil rig I put that in a chat GPT and it gives me an answer and I show it to him. He goes, I could use that right away. I, there's nothing, everything was right there that it said, mm. right? So it knows, it has sucked up all of our human writing, you know, all my blogs, all, everybody's blog, everybody's Twitter has been sucked in here. So strategy wise, Apple is in a hole right now. It's good. It, it, you know, Apple, Apple can always come in late and, uh, and tries to reposition everything that came before as lame. But now OpenAI is, you know, is, is anything Apple going to do going to write code the way that o OpenAI does? Or is it going to answer questions better than OpenAI? That's a big open question, right? And here, 
I, Irene and I just wrote a paper about the new Siri that's coming. Siri is going to have some parlor tricks because uh, if you're wearing a glass, even on a phone, your phone can know where your eyes are looking, can know, uh, uh, but let's say glasses because we're heading into a world of glasses and that's what got me real excited. If you're wearing glasses in three or four or five years, right, and you're talking to Siri, Siri's going to know what you're touching, what you're holding, what you're looking at, what you're gesturing towards, because there's sensors here watching your hands, right? And it's going to know, oh, you're holding a, a cup, right? Something like that. And if I'm holding a Coke can, for instance, I could say, hey, Siri, how much is 20 of these on Amazon? And it could answer the question. Today, nobody can answer that question because it doesn't know what you're holding, right? Um, and it can't answer that question. But, and everybody will try Siri because of this new parlor trick, right? It'll be something fun to try. Oh, it knows what you're holding or looking at or gesturing towards, stuff like that. But if it doesn't answer all the other stuff, like OpenAI does, like ChatGPT does, then, um, or any of these new large language models, then we're going to go back to ChatGPT. And that's going to be a, a huge strategic problem for Apple because eventually they're going to figure out how to do glasses too. And ChatGPT could become the operating system for your life, right? If it really got integrated into a... Uh, uh, a phone or a headset or whatever mm -hmm. it could really take take uh people away from apple so apple has to worry about this and it'll be interesting now on the other hand apple has built an ai mesh sorry apple has built a new ai mesh i mean i'm talking to you on an imac right that has an m1 processor in it 21 percent of that chip is neural network and it's not being used right now. That piece of the chip is cold right now. It's not being used to do the Zoom call or the, the restream call we're, we're on, right? It's not being used to show me Twitter or you do my email or do my Facebook, the common things most people do, right? It's sitting there for these new AI workloads. And it also is sitting next to a new kind of mesh uh, wireless networking chip called ultra wideband. Hmm. which builds a mesh. I already have 15 devices in my house that have this chip, but it also is not being used. Okay, uh, yeah, you can use Find Me to see a, uh, my, my, my uh, air tags, right? These air, air tags are, you know, I mean, heck, in my pocket, I have an, an ultra wideband radio in my uh, headphones and I have this air tag, right? And the guy who built the air tag was like, why do you think we built this thing? Why, why do you think Apple built this air tag that's spitting a radio wave into the air? Um, I don't know. <laughs> he said, well, that tag is, ma makes augmented reality better. I'm like, how to, first of all, I don't have an augmented reality device from Apple yet, so I don't know how to judge what you're talking Yeah, but they're, they're going to come someday. And when they do, they're going to use these radios around you to make, uh, to one, to see in the dark. Right, and these radios are spitting a radio wave that can bounce off the room around you and make a 3D map of the room. It also is spitting into the air the 3D location of that thing. That's why you know if I hide this under underneath a couch or something like that and pull out my phone, my phone can find my keys under underneath my couch because that radio is spitting a radio wave into the air, going, "Hey, I'm here!" Right, I'm at this 3D location, and the phone can figure out where it is. That 3D location, though, when it's used with a headset, will make the augmented reality not move, right? I have a HoloLens. Uh, where's my HoloLens? Uh, I don't know. I have a HoloLens. It has four cameras on the front of it, right? And it makes a 3D map of the world around you, right? And you can sort of see it work that way sometimes. It puts polygons on your walls and on your floor, Makes a, makes a 3D thing around you so that it can do augmented reality and put SpongeBob on your table. The problem is with HoloLens and Magic Leap and everybody who uses just computer vision, if you're dancing, if you're going back and forth like this, the stuff that's on the table moves. It's mm. not locked to the real world because the computer vision has some latency and moves around a little bit and has to figure out where the world is again, right, when you're moving that fast. And uh, Apple claims that due to this new ultra wideband radio, 
network that if you're dancing like that, everything will be locked to the real world, which is real important because that reduces the sickness rates of people, right? A lot of people say when they get into VR, they, oh, I feel nauseous. There's a lot of reasons for that. Some of it is content, some of it is operating system. Some of that is just, you know, the, the difference between what your eyes are seeing and what your ears are hearing, right? It, it, it's just not matched up properly. So it makes your mind uh, feel nauseous. So Apple's working on these problems through doing things like ultra wideband radios. But these radios are interesting, right? The, fir the first thing the radio does is, is 3D location, but it can also send, uh, it's 12 times faster than Bluetooth. Mm. So um, a phone can send my glasses data 12 times faster than Bluetooth does. So your music gets better quality and you can do a lot more things like interactive video games in your house with multiple people wearing glasses or holding a phone or tablet or something. So is it a uh, proprietary radio or, or what kind no. of technology are they using? No, but uh, Apple's the only one that has it. So mm. the, uh, real world effect is it is proprietary. It's an open standard and there's a competitive standard that just got announced at CES called YR, mm. uh, which does uh, similar kind of things. But nobody has a YR radio in any device yet. Here, Apple has been doing this for years and has 15 devices in my house that have this radio, right? So the whole ecosystem has this radio. And when they turn this thing on, the whole mm. ecosystem is going to get better, right? And, and the whole ecosystem is going to be able to talk to the M1 in the house and use that AI processing, which is uh, one entrepreneur told me that on the M1, the um, neural network capabilities there are, has more AI inferencing than an NVIDIA 3080 card. Not mm. model building, right? There's two two sides to AI. One is the building of the model, you know, the, the, the software that runs here, but the other is the runtime, uh, the inferencing, and that can be done on the M1 and soon will be done on your head because you're going to be wearing an M2 chip, right? And 21% of that is neural network as well. So a lot to come this year, right? So that's why I'm saying Apple can always look like it's sort of out, sort of lame, sort of slow, but then they can ship a whole lot of stuff because they've been planning for years to remake Siri anyways. And so it, the next year or two in Apple land is going to be interesting to see how Tim Cook reacts to open AI. Right? So what do you think will be the next big step for Apple and the AR glasses or something else? Or how, how do you see that? They're going to, they're going to, um, they don't like talking technology, so I don't know that they'll ever really talk about the radio network. I figured it out by talking to a Stanford professor who teaches radio. Right? <laughs> and, um, but they're going to show off many of these ecosystem advantages in June and show off a new AR headset, XR, VR, AR headset, right? Technically, it's VR. Nobody's going to call it that because it looks... When you're wearing the headset, you can see the real world, mm. right? What you think is the real world, you know, the, the tables and the couches around you, right? And the walls around you. But you're not really seeing the real world at all, right? You're seeing only virtual screens right in front of you. So I hear it's uh, way better than my TV. We'll mm. see, right? So do you think, are they doing it from a position of strength or um, have they been surprised by by open ai and chat gpt and I, now uh, I have to react yeah they're they're coming at vr ar xr uh from strength but they're behind on AI, ai on this new large language they don't have a large language model ai yet right they haven't shown us one and so there we is big question mark what what does apple have and if apple has nothing well they still have 250 billion dollars so they can make it I mean, th th there's potential deals that are dozens of billions of dollars, right? You know, I mean, they could do a deal with OpenAI and put OpenAI into Apple, every everything, right? They could do a deal with Google and, and get all of Google's LLMs, which Google is going to keep coming because they have all the data and they have the biggest AI team, right? Apple has the trust and the retail stores and the supply chain to make things and uh, and they have... 
fitness and music and movies and TV shows and games and all, all the stuff that we all know about on Apple's ecosystem. So they're, they're, they have strengths there, but um, they do have a hole with this uh, large language model that is a big question mark. I don't know how it's going to get solved, right? I'm not into Cook's office. <laughs> I've heard rumors. I heard rumors that he's buying things, but I haven't heard what he's buying yet. So I'm trying to figure it all out too. Yeah, and and what what about what about Google? I mean, yesterday Elon Musk said that basically um, his motivation to help create OpenAI was to create a alternative to Google because Google seemed to be like uh, Omni. Um, uh, potent in in terms of AI with DeepMind and and everything, and now yeah. suddenly it looks like um, OpenAI is absolutely on top, and Google like um, slept through it. What's what's the what's the reality here? Um, wh where do you see Google, and how fast will they be able to, to catch up? Google has a big problem, and it's their business model, right? They make a lot of profit by showing you a search with a bunch of ads around and in the content, right? When you go to a search page, you see ads everywhere. And that page was very cheap to create and serve to you, right? So it's highly profitable. <laughs> and now OpenAI comes along with a technique that uses a lot more processing. You need a data center with NVIDIA cards, right? So now you need new expensive cards to be, be able to do this new technique. And you talk to it and it, answers you in a text stream where the hell is the ads there's no business model right other than we're paying 20 bucks a month to to open ai right now and and if you're using uh the the api you're paying even more i know some people have you know are into chat gpt for thousands of dollars already right you know you start playing around and letting it go automatic and start hitting your api call and you're gonna have a little bit of a bill at the end of the month right um, where were we going with that? <laughs> yeah, basically Google's Google's market position because now with yeah. with I think with the new Bing, um, it's for the first time, in my opinion, a real threat to to yeah. Google. And then you I say on, on top. I, I mean, I'm using Chat GPT for everything uh, that I can. Once in a while, I have to go back to Google because it doesn't answer me or good. ChatGPT does have some things it doesn't do well, right? It, it can't tell you anything about the Super Bowl this year, right? Because it's not, it wasn't written, uh, the, the model was built 18 months ago. Now, plugins are starting to change that, but I, you know, people don't have plugins. Most people don't have plugins yet and don't know how to use them. And they're not as fluid as, you know, just talking to an engine, getting an answer. Um, so uh, ChatGPT uh, doesn't do recent stuff doesn't yet have a multimodal, right? We've been promised multimodal. What, what multimodal means is you can take a picture of a menu and get analysis of the menu or a, a analysis of, they they, um, uh, they showed off that somebody drew a little game on a napkin, took a picture of the napkin, it ingested the drawing of the napkin, figured it all out, and then built a video game based on the drawing, right? That's pretty cool. That's multimodal. It goes from video or pictures or music or audio into the engine and gives you a different kind of answer. We don't yet have that. Um, there's a few other things it doesn't do. Yeah, <laughs> but it's been, what the hackathon taught me was everybody is figuring out how to add on to the engine and make it better, right? I saw people creating new ways to build charts out of the data that OpenAI is giving you, right, or ChatGPT. Um, I saw people doing validation because, you know, it gives you wrong answers a lot of times, right? So you got to validate everything, make sure you don't have, you don't, particularly if you're doing something important like surgery or something. You don't want to make it or law or law. I just saw a lawyer using this, right? You got to check all the facts and all the numbers and your law documents to make sure it didn't hallucinate a mistake or, you know, put something in there that's going to get you in trouble, right? And, and so other people are building systems that do that for you, but we still are in the early days. It's like black and white TV. <laughs> in a few years, it's going to be crazy. 
How, how do you see the problem of, of hallucinations? Because um, I, I talked to John Stokes and it, re it really opened my eyes. I mean, I'm, I'm not an um, AI engineer. Um, I'm, I'm really learning as, as I go. And yeah. as I understand it, it's a it's a prediction model, right? So it tries to always predict like the next word. And yeah. um, of course, it um, it can hallucinate. It can it can just create new facts out of out of its Humans predictions. Humans do that too, right? So <laughs> exactly, exactly. But Humans but I think the I, I think the problem is that um, you you don't uh, that there's a there's a problem that if you trust it too much, right? If you take yeah. it if you take everything as a fact. Um, I, I don't think it can replace Google in its current form because of these hallucinations. Because mm -hmm. if if you would really you you would have to fact check everything, right? Because it can it can make up stuff, it can make up history and and everything. Um, yeah. ha, ha, do you do you really use it to um, for to research facts or yes. or or, uh, yeah, or because it because it helps you get close to the fact anyways. Mm. It helps you think. Right. That's why I'm saying use AI first. It helps you think if you're starting a task today, ask AI for help. It'll lay out some ideas for you. Right. Is two of those wrong? Maybe. B but that's where you apply your human brain and go, you know, four of those things were right on point. They really useful to me. Two of them were complete bullshit. And by the way, this is a common pattern I'm noticing among pe people who use AI. A lot of the people who are using it to program they say sometimes it just spits out really bad code. You know, it, it, it doesn't work. But you take that code into your code editor, run it, get an error, take the error back to chat GPT and say, hey, you give me an error in your code. Uh, here's the error message. And then it goes and fixes it. <laughs> it's like crazy, right? That's what I mean by validation. It can do its own validation in some ways. Right. Uh, one time mm. I gave it 1500 words on a, on writing I was doing and it said, hey, go and edit this. And it edited it. And most of the edits were really good. But one of the paragraphs, it changed the meaning of the paragraph. Right. Mm. It, it put some bullshit into my writing. So I had I asked to get rid of the bullshit and it, it went to the right paragraph. So it knew the right paragraph. It knew where it put bullshit. And then it tried to get rid of, you know, change it back, the meaning back. But it, it didn't quite get there. But you can see this engine is pretty interesting. If you start learning how to talk to it and, and, and how to validate it with other techniques. I was in a restaurant in Texas the other day and um, I asked him, what should I eat at this restaurant? Give me six things, four of which were right on point. Uh, two weren't on the menu and had never been on the menu, mm. right? Completely bullshitted. And I bullshit some quite confidently. You can't tell the difference between... <laughs> The, the wrong thing and the right thing, right? Until you look at the menu, you go, hey, there's two things that's not even on the menu, right? That's validation. You validated what it taught you with something else. You figured out something else overrode it, right? And so we need systems like that that do that kind of validation mm -hmm. to look at the sources of the data, right? Or tell you how it arrived at a, at a comment and then check the answer. And it, there are ways to check the answers a lot of places. The other thing you said is as of today, you're absolutely right, right? But this is mo a moving thing. Every minute it is changing. My friend is watching several searches on ChatGPT and he says, every day this thing is changing. Every day it's improving. They are tweaking it. They're m turning some of their own knobs to get it to be more accurate. And they're getting customer feedback too, because we're telling it, hey, that was bullshit. <laughs> you just give me a couple of wrong answers, right? Does that get worked into the AI? They have a lot of data, a lot of data to use uh, on this stuff. So, um, and this is the problem for Google. If everybody switches over, if all the early adopters are using open AI and they are, they're not getting that kind of feedback on their own engines. So when they turn on their LLM, you know, are they are they two, three, four months behind open AI? And yes, they are. Right. And that's the real problem is they've seen a, a number of their users switch from Google to open AI. Right. And that will continue to happen unless they get ahead. And getting ahead of open AI is really hard because this is an exponential thing. It's changing and improving over time. Right. So it's real exciting. I've, ne I've never seen 
this much change so quickly in the uh, tech industry and so many players moving around and so much money being spent. I mean, Siri cost $220 million and uh, OpenAI got $29 billion from Microsoft. It's crazy the amount of money that's being spent uh, right now to try to get an advantage, you know, and, and stay relevant. Microsoft, check. You're relevant for a while, you know. We'll see what happens later this year. Yeah. yeah, we have here a comment uh, from Robert Pitt. He says, the way we search information in ChatGPT feels much more natural to me uh, than searching through Google Absolutely. search results. I think this interaction model for search is the way forward. Absolutely. Absolutely right. I mean, I, you know, you, you, by talking to the engine, first of all, the programmers are learning to talk in English to the engine. It's a new programming language, right? You write a prompt and it can do things. Um, uh, this way of working is just much more natural. It's closer to how the human brain works, right? And it doesn't have a lot of crap around it, right? It just gives you an answer. It doesn't have a lot of ads right now. We'll see if uh, ads get added into this, but OpenAI so far hasn't signaled that they're an advertising company, right? So there's going to be that kind of where Google is, that's where they make their money. And it, it's really going to be hard for Google culturally to change. Uh, OpenAI said they, they want to become an advertising company. No, no, no. Or, I didn't say that. Okay, okay. I, I'm what just did you say? looking ahead, you know, mm -hmm. how how is this company going to make money? Mm. Are they going to go toward an advertising business? Mm. Well, they haven't signaled that at all. You know, they oh, okay. haven't started yeah. talking to advertisers about how we're going to put ad blocks into the chat GPT, right? Um, Google has... A, has the other problem which is they're making these pages very cheaply and distributing them cheaply and, and with a lot of ads around them and they make a lot of money off of them and this new way of searching and, and interacting with an, a model is is crazy the other thing is and this is the really mind-blowing thing these large language models right they like stable diffusion st st uh, stability ai ingested 100,000 gigabytes of data, right? Videos and pictures and stuff, ran it through their NVIDIA cards to build this two gigabyte model. Well, the two gigabyte model can run on the neural capabilities of any computer, right? Uh, it can run in a fairly cheap computer. Mm -hmm. Can't run fast on a fairly cheap computer, but it can run. <laughs> you know, at least you could talk to it. The large language model can work without being connected. So you can talk to, you know, uh, an LLM on your phone or on your computer. This is a huge democratizing force because I've visited slums in India and, and South Africa where people had something that looked like an iPhone, right? A touchscreen phone, but they couldn't afford the data plan. They're, they're very, very cheap, right? They, they don't have the money to pay the, you know, $20 a month for a data plan. Now they can, if they could get that file on their phone, they can talk to all human knowledge on their phone without being connected. That's insane. Mm. That's insane to me, right? Absolutely, That's absolutely. Mind blowing compression, right? Absolutely. Okay. The the model is is a is a compressed version, right, of of all the knowledge that there is, and uh, you can the not the the model is just a file. You can you can put it uh, anywhere. You can put it on on every phone or Let's whatever, about, right? China has the firewall blocking American services. Well, they don't block you at the airport when you go in, right? So uh, you could carry a terabyte file and no problem. All of a sudden you're handing out the file to people and it's spreading, spreading, spreading. Now all of a sudden everybody in China has access to the American way of looking at things, right? And by the way, I'm going to have the Chinese one as soon as the Chinese one comes out on my computer because <laughs> I want to see the Chinese way of looking at things, right? They know how to make th how to do things that we don't know how to do. So we're going to have two models now that we're going to have to talk to, you know, pretty quick to do things in life. Yeah, and Robert Pitt also added, um, also having a slightly wrong answer is still extremely useful as it allows me to understand what the next question should be in my search. Yeah, I think it, 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 needs, it, it just needs a new competency, right? I think it's completely wrong to go in it blindly and, and trust everything it says, but I think as a brainstorming tool, it's fantastic. I use it for my YouTube uh, titles, uh, for, for brainstorming ideas. Yeah. It works fantastically well. Um, but then I think the, the, the critical thing is, but I think it applies to web as well, right? I mean, you, you can't 
and believe everything that you that you read online. So, no. so I think this this fact checking or or yeah, I, I think it's interesting what happens at, on, on Twitter right talking. now, right? With with the with the community notes. So probably we need some kind of uh, community notes for the web where we can be, because um, sooner or later um, it will be impossible to tell uh, to tell the difference between a human generated um, content and and machine generated content right so so yeah. how do you think about about fact checking at, at scale I, I'm going further I tell people uh, if you get a phone call from like me you can't believe it until you validate it yeah, the phone call capability of AI now is so good that if somebody called me and uh, and said it's my son calling me from school, I might not be able to tell the difference between real one and fake one. And in fact, I assume now I can't tell the difference. So until mm -hmm. he gives me our family word and validates that it's really him and not an AI that's just pretending to be him, um, I don't, I don't believe anything i see on a digital screen or here in a digital he headphone mm. so start out with that even on twitter right anything you're seeing you can't believe it it's <laughs> it's really easy to make up stuff today and make it very convincing the visuals the video the music is all created by an ai and has no human in it right and so mm. you can't believe anything anymore until you validate it, get a second opinion, do some other homework, make sure that there, you know, is there other people reporting the same thing, right? That's sort of mm. what I do on Twitter. If I see Donald Trump died right now on Twitter, I'd be like, okay, that's interesting. Now I'm looking for other sources of the same information, right? To validate that that actually did happen, right? And everybody has to learn to do this now. Everybody does. You have to have a safe word for your family. It's just the way the world is going to be from now. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. There's, there's systems that are calling people like elderly, right? And they're trying to scam them. And they're quite convincing. So you have to have a safe word to make sure it's, you, you, you know, even the people who aren't technical in your family, you know, have some way of knowing that it's, you know, the real bank the real you, you know, if somebody's calling you from jail saying, I need bail money, you better have a safe word because you're going to get hacked. You're going to get scammed. And even smart people get scammed all the time. And it's going to happen because this stuff is so good. Yeah, Robert uh, Pitt is saying community notes for the web is interesting. Yeah, I also think we, we might need something of a, of a crowdsourced thing, maybe like um, yeah, uh, Elon is now developing on, on, on Twitter, maybe for, for the web, because in the world, when we zoom forward, when everything, basically, when 99.99% .99 of all content is AI generated, um, where do you go to, to validate facts, right? Because you only yeah. find um, generated stuff. Um, uh, so um, I think this problem really uh, will be probably bigger than, than we anticipate, right? Yeah. Having a social layer on top, you know, a, a human layer on top of AI would be a way for us to validate. And, and like, you know, I, hey, I found two things that were wrong at the restaurant. I could have, yeah, you know, said this is wrong on top of that and, and said why, you know, hey, this, the, you know, the, the manager said this stuff has never been on the menu before. And here's a picture of the menu to validate it's not on the menu, right? All of a sudden, it starts getting better and better and better over time because we're able to add our human sauce on top, right? Absolutely. Here's an interesting question by Nathan Baker. Um, he's asking, what's going on in the hardware side of this? NVIDIA seems to be ahead with GPUs and all the stuff they announced at uh, GDC. How can other hardware uh, companies compete and where does AI hardware go? Do you have yeah. a view on this? Yeah, Google has its own chips, right? So they're b building their their own uh, AI chips. Um, there, I mean, everybody I talk to wants A100 cards to build their models. And you know, if you're building a smaller model, you have a box in the in the corner with a, several of these cards. And if you're building a bigger model, you have a data center with you know millions of dollars worth of them. Um, 
I don't see a competitor right now. Uh, you know, I do see a competitor for inferencing. Apple has AI inferencing in, in my Macintosh and sitting in front of me that's not being used. So, okay, that'll be used by the end of the year. Uh, that's for runtime. For building the models, it's it's a tough one. Tesla is building Dojo and trying to compete and trying to have a breakthrough, you know, on semiconductor. Uh, Meta is spending a lot of money on custom silicon because they have a, a unique, they have a different problem. Okay, so if you're building augmented reality glasses, right, the glasses themselves, the monitors and the piece of glass and the frames are pretty lightweight. Battery adds a little bit of weight. But if you're trying to do all the processing up here in the rims of the glasses, let's say you have a GPU that's doing a lot of AI stuff, that thing is going to start getting hot if you're really doing a lot of work, right? Well, Apple can put all that down in the phone. And so um, um, several people at Meta told me about this problem that they have. Apple can put big battery, big CPU, big GPU, the 5G radios, the Wi-Fi, the ultra wideband, all the, all the technology is down in the phone. So mm. their glasses can be very, very lightweight with very few computers. All the computing is done down here. Meta doesn't have a phone, so they can't do that. So they have to they had to rethink things uh, differently than, than Apple can. They're going to put all the AI inferencing up in the cloud, right? And have the glasses do some very little work here. They're building a whole lot of custom silicon so it can make that whole architecture work. And it'll be interesting to see there. But that's not model building. That's runtime again, right? The mo model building, I, I don't know. You know, in, unless Tesla has a real breakthrough with Dojo, you know, or Google figures out that they can make their processors and and sell them to everybody else, you know, and and convince everybody to buy those instead of NVIDIA cards. Un unknown. Right now, NVIDIA is the one. There's nobody touching it. When I when I go to the hackathons, everybody wants NVIDIA cards. They, they don't see other alternative approaches yet. So are GPUs the, the limiting factor in, in the whole AI space? Yeah, that's that's how you build the models, right? The 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 thing that runs. And you gotta have the ability to run matrix math at a high scale, you know, and do a, a lot of math. I mean I you know, some of these things have many millions of dollars of NVIDIA cards in a data center building these models. Absolutely, and and where do you see Tesla in in the whole AI um, space? Uh, because Tesla says they are leading like real world um, AI, or Elon is claiming that. Um, it's so, not just uh, Elon; I'll claim it. I stand <laughs> on the Golden Gate Bridge and look at computers rolling by, and a Tesla rolls across the Golden Gate Bridge every ten seconds. Nobody else does, right? Nobody else has cameras with an AI computer on the car that's uploading data to a mothership and downloading updates. Nobody else does. I mean, I, you can say, well, Waymo does. Yeah, Waymo doesn't drive across Golden Gate Bridge. You know, not 10 times a second, not every 10 seconds, right? Um, and so he has the only real-time metaverse, digital twin of the real world, hmm. real-time or near real-time. Right, if there's a car fire on the freeway, a Tesla dro drives by it and can go, oh, there's a car fire. Can even make you a neural radiance field, which is a new 3D kind of scene, right? They've already shown this at AI Day. You can watch the videos from T Tesla's head of AI. He already said, oh, we're playing with nerfs, you know, neural radiance fields. The these are new 3D scenes that AI makes after ingesting your 2D cameras, right? So it has eight cameras on the outside it ingests those two 2D cameras and makes a 3D scene as you drive by it, right? And then shares it with everybody else so you can see, oh, there's a car fire on the on the Golden Gate Bridge. That's coming in the next year or two. Absolutely, and, and Tesla has a really powerful inference computer right in, in, every, in every car they ship. And uh, now they are building um, uh, GPUs with uh, with Dojo. Hopefully, they they will succeed. So so I think Tesla will be a a really big big player in the in in that whole space. Not only that, they have distribution. Hmm. They have a robot in my garage. Nobody else does, right? The robot eventually is going to drive off, 
without me go somewhere could go pick up another robot bring a robot home optimus right and why would you need an optimus at home well if you want to have delivery service which is what's coming with autonomous cars right um you want your car to go pick up your pizza lunch right how does it get into the round table to pick up the pizza well an optimist could get out of the car and go in the restaurant and start talking to the guy hey i'm here to pick up joe's pizza right and then on the other side it gets into the car puts it in a bag drives to your house how does it get to the front door does the car just sit it out there and honk at you until you go out and get your pizza? No, it, Optimus gets it out of the trunk and rings your doorbell. It says, hey, here's your pizza delivery, right? This is a few years away, but not many, less than 10. Sometime in the next decade, something like this is going to happen at your house, right? So you own a Tesla and, and you are in the FSD beta program. How, how has it developed over, over time and, and what's the current state from, from your point of view? With AI, it's the speed of learning. It's how, you know, is it improving at a constant rate? If it is, it, you can predict how many years it'll be before it gets done. It's starting to speed up. And all AIs seem to do this right at the end as it has less and less mistakes to figure out, right? The, the AI that beat the human being at the game of Go, right? It started out not being able to beat a child, right? It was really shitty. And then it just keeps getting better and better and better and better and better and better and better until it beats the hum best human being, right? And we're in the later stages on Tesla of that, of that process. It, yes, we still have a year to two years before it's fully driverless, right? But I can see it's getting there and it's getting there quick. I mean, we got an update uh, a week ago or 10 days ago and then another one, of, you know, a few days later and the difference was, wow, right? Big, big change. And there's another one rolling out today or tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So, the change is coming at a fast pace and that's that's what's exciting I, I can see the the end of the tunnel now where you know when i first got it five years ago man it, it couldn't do shit. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't change lanes it didn't take off ramps right it did didn't drive straight sometimes right you know i mean it was just you know a mess and it it's getting less messy over time right so what's what's still missing or or where is it still weak compared to to a human? Hmm. It's still it's starting to drive like a German. I'm half German, right? So <laughs> <laughs> it's starting to drive like that, you know, and when it does it's like damn this is good. You know, it's smooth, it's confident, it's fast, right? But once in a while, it'll behave like a robot. It'll it'll get a little confused. It'll switch a lane un needlessly. Not necessarily unsafe. Not necessarily uh, illegal, right? It's just it, it's doing something. And it's making the humans inside the car go, "What the hell's going on?" You know, what the what the hell is this thing doing? And it does a lot of that kind of thing. Still, um, it still goes too slow through stop signs, right? Because the regulation is you got to do a NHTSA stop, which is you got to stop, pause, then go. Eh, humans don't work like. Humans could slide through the stop sign if there's nobody around, right? And um, it doesn't be behave there. Uh, on turns, sometimes it doesn't get quite in the right, it doesn't do it in a human way, right? It, it takes too long to cut over and get into a path, into a, a turn lane sometimes. Like if I'm making a right turn on Collar Road, for instance, it, it does this every time. It goes almost up to the stop, like then turns in where a human is always getting in the bike lane and getting ready to turn. And it, and the way that Tesla does it, it causes problems and because people start then thinking you're going straight and they'll start passing you on the right. And then it wants to get over the right. And it, it, it you know, now it's blocked by somebody who's there. So, uh, and it could cause a potential accident. So, you know, there, there's a lot of little things like that that are, still need to be worked on but the turn across the street got way better right so 
that one used to be really bad. Now that's getting better. You know, so mistakes are starting to go away, right? In 10 miles of driving, it used to do mistake every 100 yards. Now it does it once in 10 miles, right? And, and the mistakes aren't necessarily safety mistakes. They're not going to kill you. It just bugs you. you know? and are there areas where it's already better than a human from your perspective? Oh, yeah. On freeway, it's way better than you are. It's way better than any race car driver I've ever been in. It's smoother. It's, you know, it's it's just more confident. It reacts faster. If somebody pulls in, it, it does stuff that you just, you can't do, you know? And particularly if you're looking at your phone. <laughs> you know? You know? And I see people driving manual cars all the time, looking at their phone on the freeway. I'm like, this is insane. And this is why the death rates are going up in America, right? Because more and more people are looking at their phones while driving, right? Very dangerous activity. But humans do that all the time, right? So it's certainly better than that. <laughs> you know? It doesn't get distracted. It doesn't get drunk. It doesn't get tired. It sees 360 degrees. Here's one. If a motorcycle is splitting lanes, now my car moves over, right? Mm. So it's watching uh, behind me too, you know, what, what's happening in traffic and it's changing its behavior. I, you know, humans aren't good at that. Absolutely. I mean, humans ha have just one one camera right on a, on a slow gimbal like like elon um, yeah. uh, jokes, jokes to say and uh, yeah humans drive drive tired yeah. right i mean if you if you um have just one hour lack of sleep um it's like if you have drank a couple of beers it's it's like the, like you are a little bit drunk so so humans do all kinds of uh, bad stuff and uh the, yeah. head, the head of um, Ford Safety, I, I, I've interviewed a lot of people in the, in the automotive industry over the years because I, I covered Silicon Valley innovation and all the car companies do all their innovation here in Silicon Valley now, right? They all have big R&D labs here to do autonomous cars and, and do the software that's in the cars. Um, uh, Ford told me that they instrumented all the fleet vehicles that they sell, right? They sell a lot of vehicles to police officers and taxis and all sorts of stuff like that. And they instrumented a bunch of those. They found that in an accident, so you're about to hit a tree or something like that, right? Yes, most people haven't applied full braking, uh, mm. full, they haven't applied full braking pressure in an mm. accident. Now, a computer, if it sees that it's going to hit a tree, can apply 100% braking pressure to all brakes and try to get you out of the accident. Um, but um, yeah, um, humans suck at certain things. <laughs> we, we don't, we're good at when chaos isn't happening, right? We're good at that. But when chaos, when something is radically going wrong, we're not that good at that, right? And a computer can be far better than you are. I mean, we knew this, right? Adi took me on the ice and taught me about traction control systems, computers that run the the brakes and the and the and the motors. To, today, I mean that they took me on the ice, they turned it off, and you instantly spin the car right because you're on ice you don't know how to drive on ice yet you turn on the traction control and it's impossible to spin the car right because if you are starting to slide it knows how to break the wheels to slow you down and get you not to spin computer is way better at that than a human is most of the time unless you're a race car driver right and how many people drive professionally for nascar or for formula one or something like that very very few people do right um, and so computer can do things that a human can't. That's why I'm saying AI first. Human can override, right? If we see the AIs make a mistake, I grab the steering wheel and take control or step on the brakes and take control. And so the human can always override, but the AI is generally better than you are. And within a year, it's going to be way better than you are at almost every part of driving, right? So, so do you think do you think they will they will be able to achieve full self driving with their current uh, technology stack yeah, that yeah. they have? That's 
it's already full self-driving. I mean, I, it's driving me hours without me needing to be driving, right? Mm. Um, so Tesla has shown it's possible for sure. Um, can it drive every situation? Can it drive in a snowstorm? No, <laughs> but you shouldn't be either. But but it could help you, right? Because it it can it can see things that you can't see. It can see better than you can, first of all. And here here's a way to prove this. Go outside at night with your phone, you know, an Android phone or a Google phone or an Apple phone. You the phone shows you more detail in the world than your human eye can see. So the AI has more data than to see than you can, and it can do a lot of tricks with those cameras to see things, right? Through even even snow. But um, yeah, that's gonna be a tough one. The other thing is the side cameras are fairly wide angle. And so if you have high speed traffic coming at you from the side, like I do, a, my, my street uh, pulls on to Blossom Hill and I have uh, two lanes of, of fairly high speed, 50 mile an hour traffic coming at my left door, my uh, pass, my driver door. And so it, it uh, pulls out, first of all, it's a blind spot. So it has to pull out to get the camera so it can see down the street enough. But even then it, it's skittish about it. It, it, it does a number of those steps to make my first right turn out of my street. And it's too slow. It feels like I'm in a lawyer committee, you know, and the lawyers are arguing, is it safe to go yet? I don't know. Let's pull up a little bit more and get another view. Right. That kind of thing. That, that's how the computer seems to work. Right. It's like, can't see nothing. Got to pull up. Mm. Okay. Now we can see, but uh, it's it, things are happening too fast. Let's pull up a little bit more and get a better view. Right. And, Oh, okay. Now it's yeah. We're fairly sure it's nobody's coming. All right, let's go. <laughs> it's it's like that kind of thought thought process, and you can sort of feel it in the wheel and and in the acceleration. That kind of like it's almost like a lawyer committee arguing inside your car. You know, oh, is it safe yet? Oh, nah, maybe not. Let's sit here for a little bit more. You know? <laughs> and it's getting better, but it's still not human. Right, the human can go right right away and, and get into traffic faster than this thing can. Right now, I've had many people who say I I'll wait for the car to drive because that gives me anxiety pulling into high speed traffic. Mm -hmm. Right, and here the car okay, it takes an extra half a second, and I don't care. I got the half a second to spend. It takes away a lot of anxiety from me driving, and I know it won't pull into the traffic unless it has a clear spot. So, different points of view on it. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And and how much better, in your opinion, does it have to be than a human until the first jurisdictions will approve it as a robo taxi? How far do you Ooh. think will that be away? All right, robo taxi means there's no human being in the car. It's driving completely without a human being. We're we're two years away from that, and I might be wrong. I might it might be four, right? Um, I think based on the latest updates that we're getting, I think it'll be less than two. Okay, so two is fairly conservative. It'll take maybe another year or two for the regulation because you have to have people. The car industry had me go around America and ask a question, you know, which is, are you ready to get in a car without a steering wheel, right? Like, like a Waymo, like a cruise, a GM cruise. GM cruise just started rolling around in Austin a couple of weeks ago, right? And um, uh, Waymo is doing San Francisco and Phoenix and LA and a few other places. Um, where was I going with that? Uh, <laughs> Most humans say uh, that they're not ready. They don't know how to trust this thing. One guy in Kansas told me, I'm a narcissistic control freak and there's no effing way a little computer is driving me around, he told me, right? The second question I ask him is, if 
if a car drove to you and then gave you a choice of you drive it or have the computer drive it, everybody changes to yes, which is fascinating. Hmm. Google, I had dinner with uh, Peter Norvig who ran Google R&D and he said, do you remember those little bubble cars that we had in Mountain View? You know, because uh, Google and Mountain View had these little bubble cars. In fact, if you come to the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, they have one of these cars in the lobby, a little bubble car that goes, went 25 miles an hour. I'm going, ah, I don't know, you know, did you get a cheap deal? I don't, I don't know why you, why you did bubble cars. He goes, no, what happened was nine years ago when they started handing the uh, employees the full-size Lexus with all the LIDARs, right? Mm. The spinning LIDARs and the cameras on it to do, to do autonomous. We had every employee sign a contract that they would not take their eye off the road. In other words, they would always be driving this thing, even though it was going to be autonomous driving, right? And uh, there's sensors on the steering wheel, sort of like a Tesla has sensor to sense whether you're tugging on the steering wheel or not. And there's a camera watching you and they showed you the camera and there's uh, sensors on, on the brake and the acceleration pedals, right? And, and he told me everybody broke and they did this under threat of firing. If you take your eye off the road for more than two seconds, you will be fired, right? And that's what the contract said. Everybody broke the rule in three days because mm. it was so fun. Nine years ago, it was so good at driving around <laughs> that you get bored and you pick up your phone and you start talking to somebody, you get distracted, right? You get involved in a Zoom call or something like that and you're just not looking at the road anymore and the sensor sees that. And so they realized they had a problem because this, the technology was sort of like where Tesla was up to today. It was good but not perfect and it would make mistakes here and there it still makes mistakes here and there right um and so they 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 knew they had a problem and they had to bake a car that only went 25 miles an hour so if it hit somebody it wouldn't kill anybody mm. right sort of silicon valley uh, uh risk analysis <laughs> kind of lawyers lawyers run everything if you haven't figured it out and when i worked at microsoft Lawyers ran everything. They had 803 lawyers when I worked there. Mm. They had to prove every freaking thing. And I, I can see the same effect here. So anyways, they had the data to know if you get three days in an autonomous car, you're never going to drive again. Mm. Unless you're on a racetrack in a nice Audi or something. You know, okay, great. But most people drive in a traffic on a freeway or, you know, around their neighborhood. And um, it's about to change. Where I was going is humans don't change that fast, even though we're shipping huge, huge amount of change to people, they don't change that fast. So um, autonomous cars need the data. You need to convince people this is safe, right? And that takes millions and millions of miles of data on the road to prove to the regulators and to human beings that no, this doesn't, this doesn't get in wrecks anymore, right? And when we get there, then then you'll see the regulation approve it. And you'll see regulation already approving it. Because, you know, governments are pretty smart. They realize this stuff is going to make us much more productive, much more productive. And, and stops killing people. My, my two best friends died in high school in car wrecks. That's mm. ridiculous. So... We have the technology now to stop that, but we don't have the, the ability to put it in everybody's cars because it's, it's expensive. Right? Yeah, yeah, Tes cool. yeah. Tesla has has shipped cars with with uh, sensors and cameras since since when? I don't know. Twenty fifteen. My, my car's five years old. I yeah. bought one of the first ten thousand Model Threes, and it it has all the cameras and the com and the AI computer. I had to get the AI computer updated, uh, but that was part of the deal. But self-driving back then yeah they shipped it in the in the model s already so so it was i, I don't know whether 2015 2016 but really early and i think that's one way to tell if a car manufacturer is really serious about um, full self-driving whether they put sensors and cameras I, and expensive I, hardware in it right 
I gave a talk to Mercedes R and D team in Sunnyvale, you know, at the R and D lab, and I asked them, "Why aren't you putting a computer in your car that can always upload, always download, right? Uh, update itself? When are you going to put an AI computer in the car that can do computer vision, right? See the road, help do all all sorts of stuff." Oh, uh, you know, the answer was, oh, we can't do what Tesla's doing. We're Mercedes. We're scared of getting hacked. We're a worldwide brand. And, you know, if something bad happens, it kills our business around the world. And um, in other words, they were unwilling to take risks mm. and innovate because of fear, right? Mm. And and corporate cultures, right? And another one, when are you going to put a touchscreen in the, in the car? I asked them, right? And this was seven years, eight years ago. And they said, well, uh, we're German. We don't like people touching the glass. We don't want fingerprints <laughs> on the glass, you know? So we put a knob in between the seats to do all the navigation, you know, all the stuff on the screen, you know? I'm like, there's other ways to solve this. Just put a rag in the in the, in the the car so somebody can wipe off the screen if they, if they care about fingerprints, you know? That's what I do. I have a little uh, microfiber cloth. I wipe it down every week or so, right? And it gets too many fingerprints they just couldn't get to that point. Tesla is like, everybody's going to touch their screen because we all have iPhones and iPads, right? You know? Absolutely. How, how do you see the competitive landscape for autonomous driving? H how far is Tesla ahead and, and who's number two, number three, in, in your opinion? It, it depends where you put the goals, right? If you're talking about who has a driverless car driving around the city right now, well, Tesla doesn't. They're behind. Uh, GM Cruise does, right? They're driving in San Francisco and Austin and Phoenix and other places. Uh, Waymo, which is Google's company, is. They're, they're driving around San Francisco and other places, right? Um, Zook sort of is, but, you know, that's an Amazon company now, but not really. Uh, not at scale. The problem is scale, all right? So if you define it as who is going to get to worldwide scale first, it sure looks like it's going to be Tesla because they have millions and millions of cars with these cameras and these AI computers on the road already. Nobody else does, right? So if you're going to compete with that, you have to manufacture millions of cars and put them around the world to do robo taxi and and all and build the brand and get people to trust it. It's a lot. Um. I've been predicting for a long time that Tesla's going to win the game because of this, because they, they have a steering wheel in their car. Start with the research. People don't want to have a completely autonomous car yet. They're not, mm -hmm. they don't trust it. They don't know how to trust it. They don't know how it works. They don't know, you know, what brand is good. There's a lot there for a consumer. I study consumer behavior through paradigm shifts, right? That's a lot of, a lot of resistance, a lot of fear, a lot of uh, learning that they have to do. Um, and so here, Tesla has a car that's fun to drive. Everybody knows that Tesla goes faster than a Maserati, right? Zero to 60, at least. <laughs> right? So it's more fun to drive. Everybody knows this. Everybody who's been in a Tesla knows it's more fun to drive than any other car on the on the road, period. End of discussion. I've been in very, very expensive cars. My te I would ha rather have my Tesla than any of those cars, by far manually driving so now uh they have a brand that is going to be hard to compete with if they get it done and i i can see they're going to get it done it's just a couple more years two to four more years and it's not mm -hmm. only more fun it's also the safest car out there right so if you care about your own life about the lives of your family and and friends then uh, this should it's... never hit somebody else right that's the goal it, it should never cause its own accident. Now, if a mudslide falls right in front of you and you can't stop, okay, you know you're you're gonna hit that. But even yeah, then, but, he, but even if it crashes, the the probability of injury and death is the lowest of any yeah. car ever tested. So it's uh, uh, yeah. that there are so many arguments. What are your top three arguments to 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 get a Tesla? It's fun. Serious. That, go back to the original sales pitch. Elon, Elon gave me the first ride and the first Tesla before he gave his best friend a ride. So I heard the first sales pitch, right? And the first sales pitch was electric motors are cheaper and more fun than gas motors. 
they have more torque and you know they don't pollute the environment so you can feel good about yourself there um but they're fun and they're um they have advantages that gas engines can't for instance he demoed uh the the brushless motors that they use are computer controlled and mm -hmm. so they can be computer controlled to never slip right so if you're on gravel and they start slipping right you're stepping on the accelerator and they start slipping they instantly back off sort of like uh audi car did on the ice right uh, by using brakes but tesla's using the motor <laughs> they don't even have to get the brake involved in, in uh, um, traction control. Mm -hmm. And they can do traction control a gas car can't do. A gas car has 430 moving parts that have to spin up to apply traction to the ground. A, a Tesla has you know, a, a motor on, on both sets of wheels that can be instantly turned on or off, right? So it's safer on on snow ice whatever it's more fun at a stop sign race right you've got a lambo next to you you're gonna blow away the lambo even on an old model four and model three right um and the experience of being in the car once you go electric uh, you want to work in it in a hot sunny day you know in the middle of a parking lot no problem you can sit there all day long and the AC works just fine, right? It's electric. It's an electric. It's like your house. It, it, it heats and cools down. And so the, the experience of being in a, a, an electric car is way better than gas. Way better. It's not even close. I, I will never, ever buy another electric gas car, right? And I never will buy a car that doesn't pull self-drive. So what's 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 the secret sauce in your opinion uh, of of Tesla? What what is uh, its uh, competitive advantage, or or how do you see the the company as a whole? I think Elon now describes it as a as a uh, robotics company with with AI and also top top notch manufacturing um, company. Yeah. How, how do you how do you see Tesla right now, and what's its secret sauce? I uh driving 10 every 10 seconds across the Golden Gate Bridge nobody else is and that's going to give him huge advantages he has the data he has data nobody else has right everybody else has data of the Golden Gate Bridge but it's not real time with cameras with an AI computer going across it right so th that's a huge advantage at this point I mean everybody knows what Tesla is everybody knows you know if you want to look up you know, all the videos of how it's made. It's made better. You, you know, you go to Monroe Live, he tears apart cars, he t explains they're way better made than any other vehicle. So um, they're safe, right? Because they made different. I drove my Tesla to Detroit to go visit Ford and get a tour around Ford with a, a former executive. And they make their trucks on a, a rail, right? And that means that their manufacturing line is a long snaking line it makes a lot right they make they can make 750,000 vehicles a year the ford f-150s on this line it makes a new truck every 60 seconds right a new one since we've been talking probably 40 40 new trucks have been made right so it's it's pretty good but it's a long line it takes uh i think three days from the start of the line to the end of the line when the truck is mm. driving off so it's a long snaking line where the the frame gets everything put on top and window put in and all that tesla is making the front and the back in a casting machine it's very different the casting machine means it's lighter it's safer in an accident because the energy is an exoskeleton now. So on a Cybertruck, when you hit something, the energy will go around the passenger component. With a frame-based thing, a lot of the energy gets passed to the passenger component because of the frame, because of how it's made. It's made completely different. And they have a longer line making a frame where the, you know, the, the um, casting machine, for instance, my Model 3, the back of it has, I think, uh, 70 kind of pieces that would, were welded in place by robots, right? Now that's one piece in a Model Y, right? So there's a lot shorter manufacturing line. So in these big factories that they have, they can have multiple lines and parallelize the manufacturing. So they can make a lot of them cheaper than Ford can. 
and it has just benefit after benefit it, into the vehicle. It has one disadvantage. You know, Ford is going to win one customer uh, over the Cybertruck, which is the bed can come off, right? Because it's on a frame. It's mm. more customizable. You can't cut apart a Cybertruck because it's an exoskeleton. You cut it apart, you ruin the structural integrity in an accident, right? People will do that anyways, you know, to make a limo <laughs> out of a Cybertruck or something like that, right? But that won't survive an accident as well as a Cybertruck alone will. So people will be reticent to cut it apart and do all sorts of weird shit to it. Um, yeah, the Ford, the Ford is going to win. And a lot of people buy trucks for customization, right? Put a tow hitch on the back or put a glass truck on the back or put some box on the back or right. It, you drive around America, you see all sorts of people doing all sorts of weird shit on their trucks, right? You know, pulling up weird stuff, having weird things on the back to do various things. So, uh, customization is going to be a, a problem. But if you don't care about customization, the, the Cybertruck will be better in all other ways. You know, it'll be quieter, safer, lighter, longer range, right? Better experience inside. Absolutely, absolutely. And and it will and it also, also and it will also pull, pull in uh, non-truck um, people, right, to to own a Cybertruck just because it's, it's cool and... Uh... Well, it'll be a better experience inside. Sitting inside, it's going to be quieter because it's airproof. And so they can do noise canceling on the inside uh, in a way that nobody else can, unless they make an airtight compartment, right? So, absolutely. We we had some other uh, comments here from uh, Kazi, for example. Um, he says uh, Tesla's cars itself is an AI. The data is important, no matter if it's ling linguistic or visual. And Elon yeah. has Twitter and FSD data, data which Microsoft never um, will have, I assume. Yeah, so yeah. so that's that's interesting. Um, how totally do you agree. see how do you see Elon's master plan now with with uh, with uh, with Tesla's data, with uh, Twitter's data? Um, uh, yeah, well, I think that, that Twitter could, has yeah. a lot of data that I, you know. I, I was in uh, Barcelona a few months ago, and I was on the waterfront there, and I, I wonder what what Twitter has about the waterfront. So I did a search for fun things to do at the waterfront. And sure enough, there was hundreds, I mean, thousands of tweets from the waterfront, right? Because people who go to the waterfront have are having fun. They take a picture and tweet it, right? And go, hey, the, this restaurant's really cool. Look at the food here. Or, hey, there's a nice playground for the kids over here, right? And so it has all that data. So you start thinking, oh, okay, if I'm going to Las Vegas, for instance, um, Twitter knows where the hot nightclubs are. Right, because people last night were tweeting their fun times at the nightclubs, right? And Tesla knows where the fun nightclubs are because every owner <laughs> is being surveilled on their phone, right? The, the, you have a tw Twitter uh, Tesla app, which is constantly reporting to Tesla where your phone is. So it knows how long people have been standing in line at each nightclub, how what their dwell times were inside the nightclub, right? And that's the kind of data and AI loves to compile and you know bring into into bear. So soon you're going to ask your Tesla, "Hey Tesla, where should I go for for a nightclub in Las Vegas tonight?" And it's going to go, "Oh, here's the three hottest ones as of last night, and here's the kind of music, here's some pictures, here's some you know videos, <laughs> so you can see that what's inside each nightclub, right? And some highlights, maybe even a 3D map on a, a Nerf." If you have enough pictures of a nightclub inside, you can build a NERP of it, right? So now an AI could build a 3D scene of that, right? Mm. And show you what the nightclubs actually look like in 3D on your screen, yeah. So infinite. It, Twitter has a lot of data to bring uh, of that type to a, a Tesla owner, right? To make their lives better and make the car better by right? talking to the car, hey, Hey, car, where should we go for lunch? You know. Absolutely, I think twi Twitter is a huge is a huge asset. Uh, and ChatGPT shows yeah. you the basics of that, right? I mean, you go to Austin, you're in Austin for the first time. You heard it has good barbecue. You ask ChatGPT, "Where's the good barbecue places within twenty miles of me?" Right? It tells you. It tells you. It, it knows. It's really cool. <laughs> 
do, do you think OpenAI has a has a full data set of, of Twitter or have they licensed it? Do, do you know that? They have a lot of it because a lot of my stuff is in there, right? If you start asking it questions, it knows a lot about about what I've been tweeting and you know what I do on Twitter. So it it, it, it ingested a lot of Twitter. Does it have it all? Seriously doubt it. Does OpenAI have a fire hose? Okay, fire hose feed on Twitter means you get a feed of every message being sent on Twitter right now, right? That, that's a huge number of messages. Um, I don't think they have an. I don't think they have a fire hose feed, and it seems like Elon's been closing down all the AI um, API stuff, right? So he's sort of been signaling to everybody now that free game is over. We're not going to allow your AI, your AI to come in here and grab data out of Twitter without paying for it, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And now that Elon seems more and more critical of of OpenAI, and he even suggested to to uh, yeah some some kind of lawsuit or something. I think on Twitter today. So yeah, I, I think yeah. things may, may may be heating up behind the scenes. So uh, I, I don't think that they have access uh, beyond just public scraping, right? Yeah. So yeah, how, there's, how, how, mm -hmm. there's a lot there. And, and do they have access to all the Twitter Spaces data? This is where Ooh. I want to know. Because <laughs> I've been on Twitter Spaces like a lot of them over the last two years, right? A uh, year and a half. And um, thousands of hours of just my voice talking to it, right? And mm. on, on all sorts of interesting topics. I've told it a lot of things, right? And interacted with thousands of people on Twitter Spaces, and they recorded all that, right? So now, can they use that to build a new voice system that yeah. really understands your voice and understands your intention at a deep level that others can't, and make it cheaper than like OpenAI's Whisper, which does the same thing? So that's what what I'll be uh, talking to the voice people about next week. Hmm. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, but he yeah. has a data set to do some training. The man, <laughs> Twitter has a lot of data behind it. You know, there's here's one I, I asked um, uh, Chat GPT, "Hey, can you help me with my fantasy football team?" And it gives you an, an answer. Oh, I'm a you know machine. I'm a machine learning system. Um, I can't help you with anything newer than 18 months ago. Right, so I can't, I can't tell you what your fantasy football team did in the Super Bowl this year, right? Well, Twitter has the entire football team on, on Twitter, right? <laughs> the coach is on Twitter. The press is on Twitter. <laughs> the, the most of the team is on Twitter, right? So, Twitter has the data to make something like that possible where chat GPT can't even answer the question yet. And if you try to use plugins, it's, it's just not a, as satisfying as what it could be if, if Twitter built its own AI and made it work with real-time data. And Twitter is a real-time system, so that's a big challenge. I don't know that they can get there. I, I don't know what the latency between building the model hmm. and getting the data into you know from from real time that that'll be a challenge and and it'll be interesting to see if elon can solve that one or do a hybrid approach where one system is doing real 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 time and another system is doing what what uh, chat gpt is doing you know uh, bundling together all the knowledge so unknowns Way so over you, my so, 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 so do you think Elon has a has a shot at at creating something uh, an alternative? Yeah, he has to... the data. First rule is you got to have the data. He has the data, right, to do some of the things we've been talking about. He has the data. Twitter has the data, and Tesla has even more data, different kind of data that can be merged together, right? Absolutely, I think the I mean, data. The Tesla, no. if it drives by a Las Vegas nightclub, and it sees a line out in front, they can go, oh, there's 114 people in line here for some, oh, Britney Spears is playing tonight, something like that, right? So you can put that into the system and go, oh, there's a hot concert tonight, everybody's standing in line, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, really interesting. The, the only question is, Elon said that he would like to, or, or his goal with Twitter is to get to the truth uh, or, or, or basically have a, 
have a site that is as as truthful as as possible and he referred to his new system as something like a, a truth a gpt uh the the question is how do you how do you how do you get there right um yeah what we talked about before what is even truth how do you fact check things and uh yeah how do you how do you balance the system so that it's uh so that it's not not extreme right you build a second llm that does fact checking on the first one and you have a validator right i i've seen early parts of this being built at the at the uh gpt uh, hackathon this weekend where one of the companies was building a validation system to validate all the facts that it showed you right um we're still a ways away from that but that's what i i would be building three llms right one llm to con that you talk to in the car or on your phone or on your glasses one that really runs the system behind one that does the personalization keeps track of you because as you teach it oh i like pepperoni pizza why isn't that being stored permanently on your account somewhere now we have a lot of privacy problems there right mm. but could we run that locally where where the the user gets to control it right and have it for themselves and, and control where that data gets used right so they have control of their privacy we need a system like that so you need three or four new ais um, mm. to to you know to really get to the promised land and we'll see we'll see how we get there it's moving fast <laughs> you know i mean i'm watching twitter go by the real time and people are working on all sorts of weird shit you know Oh, yeah, and, and the, the development at Twitter now that Elon took over has really accelerated, right? I mean, Twitter felt really slow before from a development perspective, yeah. and now he's rolling out subscriptions and uh, yeah, community notes and and all of all of these things, um, open sourcing uh, like parts of the algorithm, and uh, I think really really um, cool things that uh, other companies will also take take note. Uh, uh, from so uh, yeah, but it, it, you guys can't see this. Let me see if I can show you what, <laughs> what my tweet. Oh looks wow! Like, right. <laughs> so I mean, this is just a piece of my tweet deck, right? That this is all the tech news, all the world news, right? And fifty-five thousand people on this com, right? So <laughs> um, Twitter is the only real-time filterable social system, right? Uh, news system. You can't do this on Facebook or LinkedIn or you know uh any of the others um and um twitter it, you know twitter could be something very very different soon because of ai you know mm. most people don't want to stare at this it's too much it's too much for me i mean i built it but it uh it's too too hard for my human brain to watch this for very long. And I certainly would love to teach an AI patterns that I wish it warned me about, right? And tell me about any time you see the, the letter AI next to a, a new company name that you've never seen before. Well, that's probably a new, a new company. That's a news item, you know, show that to me. Is there an earthquake somewhere that... I was the first person to tell somebody about the Chinese earthquake you know, years ago that was about an 8.0 because of Twitter, because three people on Twitter said earthquake thousands of miles apart. And I've yeah. lived through a few earthquakes. So I knew that was a big, big earthquake. We beat CNN that night by 45 minutes because of that. Right. So an AI can be watching those kinds of patterns and going, yeah. oh, there's an earthquake, 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 earthquake. There must be an earthquake. Let's warn everybody there's an earthquake, right? And maybe even warn people before the wave gets to you, right? Because it takes a few seconds. If the earthquake is up, in, you know, north of San Francisco, I'm an hour south. So it, I'll see it on Twitter. I'll see people saying I'm we're in the middle of a big earthquake before it gets to me. Hmm. Right? So I can change my behavior and get away from glass before a big earthquake wave gets to me right maybe save my life that's real time 
So like I a real time cu curation or, or how, how would you call that? Like a filtering curation slash assistant mode, right? Where it yeah. summarizes it for you or brings to your attention what's most relevant and most important to you in, in any moment, right? Without you having to go through uh, yeah, uh, ginormous amounts of, of data like like we do today. I mean, it's super inefficient, like like we are operating today, right? Chat GPT, I asked it, uh, I needed a screw at, at uh, the local Lowe's. I said, how do I find a screw in Lowe's? And it took me to the right aisle, told me where the freaking screws were in oh, the wow. Lowe's, right? It has an understanding of 3D-ness. Even in a store, it understands a store. That's insane to me. Right. So in a, in a rapidly changing news environment where something is happening that is affecting your life, can it help you fix whatever's going wrong? Right. It, your wife is lying on the floor, not breathing. What do you do? Can it help you save your life, her life and make a better outcome? This is what I'm saying. Use AI first for everything. Right. Mm. Now, the problem is the, the, the it, it's there's a lot of friction you have to type into it hey my wife is lying on the floor not breathing what should i do and then you have to wait for it to answer that's 40 seconds uh, that's that's not good right so it, can we make that easier and faster where you can talk to it soon you're going to be wearing a pair of glasses and you can literally ask it that or say hey my wife just fell and is lying on the floor what do i how do i do cpr show me Mm. You might not even know how to do CPR, but it can show you in real time. By the way, it knows this. Chat GPT, I asked it this question. It tells you how to save somebody's life, mm. right? It has the steps, boom, 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 what you need to do. And it'll help you make better decisions in such a crisis mode, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I read recently on Twitter that it helped save uh, someone's dog's life. That's um, a different point of view, but yeah. It, absolutely that guy yeah. went to a veteran area yeah, exactly. dog the vet couldn't figure out what was really going on he went home put in all the drugs the dog was doing was taking and uh the symptoms that he was seeing and it it answered the question said oh the dog probably has this disease went back to the vet and the vet looked into it yeah yeah it was right on absolutely true Right, it can see patterns that humans struggle with seeing. My Absolutely. my uh, another great friend died of colon cancer because the doctors missed it. Right mm. now, could we have gotten twenty five hundred dollars and gotten him into an MRI and gotten a scan done? The AI is better at seeing tumors and scans than doctors are. Right already, and this was seven years ago when I went to Israel, Zebra Medical. Hmm. already was seeing scans in x-rays and cat scans and we're already beating the doctors back then now it's way better right this is this is why we're having this doom ai doom conversation i sat next to an ai safety engineer for 10 hours coming home from uk last year and he was he gave me that stat he was like AI could run away and decide humans are not important anymore. I'm like, how could it come to that conclusion? He goes, it's already better than surgeons. It's seeing scans. So it might decide we don't need surgeons anymore. <laughs> mm. Right? And the surgeons are working on a robot. Right? When they're doing surgery now, they're working on a robot. I've, I've used the robot. I built the suture in the robot. You, you, you can do the complete surgery in the robot so if the robot is already doing the surgery ai mm. might decide someday i'm better at surgery than this dude is let's get rid of him let's do something to get rid of humans go unaligned right unaligned to human needs and so yeah that's the downside i see it the other way which is it helps the humans it makes our lives way better yeah, the only problem is if we if we get to a runaway situation, right, where where we build something that can um, replicate itself, that can improve itself, that can get access to the real world, like get access to I don't know resources or manufacturing, three D printing, whatever, and then what really runs on create... those computers, right? The exactly. AI could figure out how to get onto that computer, and take over. <laughs> 
<laughs> that's the fear. I'm not. That argument is way over my pay grade. And it, even if it came true, my mom joined a survivalist church and she thought <laughs> Russia was going to bomb America with nuclear weapons. And this was 30 years ago, right? It never happened. So, you know, she spent a lot of time worrying about something that never happened and spend a lot of money. You know, she had a nuclear fallout shelter because she thought World War III was going to go down. And so did everybody in her church. Um. You know, so I, I come at it that way. I don't worry about it too much because that is way over my pay grade. I'm not a I'm not a, a person who's building the AI and I can't keep it from running away anyway. So it's not something I can really do too much about either way. But I can see it's going to help my kids. It's going to help me. It's going to help everything in, in life. And it hasn't killed me yet. So I'm in. <laughs> Right. And, and, My Tesla could kill me anytime, right? Sure. It has millions of opportunities to kill me every drive. Because sure. I'm sure. usually not paying attention to driving now. So that and goes. I think that the super doomsday scenario, I mean, is like that there's some some kind of I don't know, some some kind of switch or something, and then it the switch goes off and, and we all fall fall dead. I mean, if if that happens, then everyone dies anyway. So so um yeah, but but um, yeah, it's it's also above my pay grade, obviously. But I, I I listen to the people who worry about this stuff, and I think it's it's a concern, and probably we need some kind of regulation or we need some kind of safety. Uh, we we just need to think about safety because we're playing. I, I think this has the potential to uh, play with with fire, right? I mean, it's it it we can we could unleash a huge monster with with that, and and I think that is dangerous. Yep, um, and yeah, I had, uh, I had this guy freaked me out like this for 10, 10 hours. <laughs> and, it, <laughs> you know, it does have that capability. All technology has a good and a bad, right? You can use a database to kill people. You can use a database uh, to sell things. You can use a database to write, uh, you know, sermons. In fact, I was talking to a bunch of pastors who are using AI to write their sermons, right? Um, cars kill 43,000 people in America every year, right? Mm. Yeah, we, I drove this morning, right? Took a lot of risk because other people could have been drunk or ran a red light, right? has a huge downside, but a huge up, a bigger upside. And AI is gonna have a much, much bigger upside. So we're gone, we're gonna use it. And it's not stoppable anyways. Yeah, you can't, you can't put it back in the, the, in the bottle, is, right? Oh. Once you got the LLM, you, you know, my friend Brian Rommel is building his own LLMs in his garage. Hmm. How are you gonna stop that? You gonna go and take away everybody's computers? Uh, that, that won't work in, in America. We have too many guns. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, Robert, you're you're a futurist. Uh, so paint us a picture of of your future. How will the world look like in in ten years or any time frame frame you might choose? Um, in ten years, we're going to have a pair of glasses that you're going to talk to multiple AIs. Um, by the way, even if you just talk to one AI, let's say you're just talking to GPT, right? Open AI's uh, LLM. That one LLM can have different points of view and argue with you from different points of view. And that's what the bleeding edge people are doing is building contextual committees. So your, your search is going to be you know, uh, let, let's say you're going into a restaurant. Well, you could have great restaurant critic and a great chef and a right. Tell me, a, you know, this restaurant from the point of view of different people or different points of view. Like one of them, when you go to a restaurant, tell it, hey, hey, show me the foodie point of view. Right. Or show me the vegetarian point of view. Well, that means that the computer can argue the foodie point of view against the vegetarian point of view and have an argument over something, right? I don't know why you would do that for a specific meal, but if you're running a business or trying to build something, having like a board of directors that would argue this out for you is a very useful thing to get the engine to do. And so 
we're going to have virtual beings around us in a pair of glasses where we can talk to, you know, Obama's over here and Hillary Clinton's over here and Donald Trump's over here, right? Hey, let's talk politics now, right? <laughs> right? And have those three go at it with you, interact with you, talk to you, mm. help you, you know, come to a better conclusion. Let's say you were uh, going to vote, you know, tomorrow. Well, you could talk to your little voting committee. Uh, tell me the Republican point of view on this. Tell me the you know, the Democratic's point of view, tell, right? Tell me the Libertarian's point of view. Tell me this point of view. And you can come to a better decision that way. So you, you're going to have virtual beings. You're going to have a virtual environment that you can talk to. Uh, hey, environment, take me to the Taj Mahal. Boom, you're in the Taj Mahal, right? Hey, environment, take me to Yosemite National Park. Boom, you're in Yosemite National Park. Hey, environment, take me to a concert. Boom, you're in a concert, right? Uh, and that's a neural radiance field, 3D thing done by AI for you. Um, the glasses are going to know uh, what you're looking at because there's eye sensors, right? And watching your eyes. What's happening is computing is getting closer to your brain, right? And is integrating into your humanness deeper and deeper and deeper to the where, you know, someday you'll get a, a bunch of wires put on your brain and be jacked in, right? Neuralink style. But for the next decade, we're going to be wearing a pair of glasses to get that kind of computing. Um, and so you're going to be able to virtualize a big monitor in front of you, right? Why would I be looking at a small, why would I be looking at a small monitor in 10 years? No, no. Like, the, I've seen the glasses, right, from Israel. and that You get a virtualized monitor that, that's huge or several monitors right around you. So I could have five monitors instead of just one because I can only afford one and I don't have a ability to put physical monitors all over. Like a, a stock trader has five, right? Um, so we're going to be there. Um, the glasses are also going to be um, listening to you, watching your hands. So it's going to know what you're holding, touching, gesturing toward, right? And then we're going to have an autonomous car system from a variety of manufacturers. So I hit Hey, uh, Siri, can you get me lunch? You know, I want some pizza today, right? And at 12, pizza shows up, right? Um, entertainment is about to radically change because, um, uh, let's, let's back up on entertainment. Um, Edward Saatchi won a Grammy for his work on uh, VR. On, he built a company called Fable Studios which used to be Oculus Story Studios, spun it out. And he built a thing called Wolves in the Walls. And Wolves in the Walls, you put on a VR headset, and um, uh, I was thrown into this girl's house, right? A little girl, uh, animated girl. And she was jumping around her bedroom. So it, it, it threw me into um, her house, and I could see her bedroom over there. And she was writing on the walls. And then she comes over to me, in this VR headset and starts talking to me, right? Well, now that we have ChatGPT, we can understand how a character might have a conversation with you like that, right? Cheaply. She also handed me a virtual uh, flashlight and I took it with my controllers and I you know, used it like a real flashlight and it shone mm. up the, the world like a real flashlight did. And I aimed it at her and looked at her and I looked at it for like 10 minutes. I was so amazed that an entertainment property had handed me a virtual thing and I was playing with the virtual thing in my hand, you know, like, wow, that movie, a movie just handed me something. Right? <laughs> I was like, wow, that's crazy. And um, there was a, a table with a bunch of stuff. There was a Polaroid camera there. So I grabbed the Polaroid camera and played around with that too for a bit. And I figured out you could take pictures. <laughs> but I took a picture of the girl, the animated thing with this Polaroid camera. It spit out a virtual Polaroid picture and I and I grabbed it and watched it develop like a real Polaroid camera, right? Mm. A, a real pol Polaroid uh, picture did, right? I used to sell cameras, so I sold a bunch of these Polaroid cameras. This is a movie. The problem is this costs $15 million to make. It's very mm. expensive. And 
very hard to recreate into another movie and another movie, another entertainment property. You can, you replace all of that with generative AI. Now you can see how you're going to make that environment very cheaply. And that has Hollywood hot and bothered. You can create the story with, you know, uh, open AI has a, has a script writing tool for AI. Mm -hmm. to help the script writers write scripts and come up with new stories, new ideas, right? They have ways to make all the objects, the Polaroid camera, is generated now, right? Mm. And we're seeing the the innovation every day right now is like text to video, video to text, you know? <laughs> In other words, next year, you're going to see a lot of things come out that are like this, that are a 3D environment you talk to, 3D uh, beings that are in that environment that you talk to, 3D things that are, look real that you can interact with and do things with, all created by VR, uh, by generative AI, very, very low cost. So Hollywood can do these things profitably. And that's what changes entertainment. I had dinner with Robert Rodriguez one time, and he's a famous movie director. He, his first movie he created for $7,000 and it went on to make a couple million dollars. He used technology of the day to, ch to create entertainment properties for less money that were very, very entertaining, right? And he found a way to do movies very cheaply. The same thing is gonna happen right now. Some, somebody is gonna figure out how to use this technology to entertain people in a new way and make money with it. And that'll change the whole entertainment industry. And they know it, they, they're working on it as well, so. Do you think we will see something like an immersive, completely immersive experience like uh, portrayed in Ready Player One? Or, or um, do you see more, more like um, either uh, with the glasses, like a, the, the AI, AR approach, or would you see the complete immersive approach man, with, a, with, a, with a newer link in your, in your brain? We got to talk about VR now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So th these are Apple Max headphones. Audio people don't like these headphones because they're closed back, uh -huh. right? It's a piece of aluminum that's covering your ear. It keeps analog, the real world, from hitting your eardrum. Yet, when you click this button into transparency mode, you hear the real world. Well, you think you're hearing the real world. You're not hearing the real world at all. You're hearing what the microphones picked up the computer processed and amplified and put into a speaker into your ear. You're hearing the speaker, you're hearing the computer. You're not hearing the real world at all. Mm. Right? Then you push the button and it gets rid of the real world altogether, it, noise canceling, right? You can't hear the real world at all, right? I hear a plane going overhead. If I had these on and I was in noise canceling, I wouldn't hear that plane, mm. right? This is technically VR because Everything you're experiencing in here is virtual. There is no reality. When I'm wearing this, I can't hear reality anymore, right? Hmm. Same thing when they put chip in front of your eyes. Now you have a headphone in your ear like that, or, or like the smaller ones, really. Mm -hmm. And you have something in front of your eyes that's completely virtual. If the device is off, you can't see through the first device. Mm. It's not a pair of glasses. It's a heavier device like this. It's a little lighter than this one, but it's about that. So it's technically VR, but nobody will call it VR because what you see in it is going to be the real world around you. And now you could get, like, I have a printer over here. It could take the printer and get rid of it and put something else, put SpongeBob there. Because it knows all the 3D pieces of the environment. And it can generate anything anyways. It can make a, it can know that that printer is on a, you know, a, a, a cabinet. Um, so now it could fake the cabinet. It could mm. get close to the cabinet. It doesn't need to be exact. Because if I'm wearing a headset like that, all I need to know is that there's something there, right? And that there's a SpongeBob on top of it, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know? right? But that's going to 
the uh, the affordance is augmented reality. What people will think of that is that's augmented reality because it's messing with reality to them, mm -hmm. even though they're not seeing reality at all. You're not hearing reality at all in this headphone. Even though it sounds like reality, I wore this at Christmas dinner last last year to, to prove this point that I could talk to everybody, even though I was wearing a headphone that was blocking them from my ears. But couldn't you argue that the senses that we humans have are also just um, like cameras and microphones and and uh, uh, other sensors, and yes. that we never that that already as a human we we never perceive reality as it is because we only perceive the reality um that our brain makes out of all the information that we collect with our sensors and if we had other sensors our reality would look differently right bingo um behind me ibm research has a lab up on the hill ibm a new alvin and research center this house was built for ibm researcher 50 years ago they have a $20 million machine there that lets me see the atomic level. They let me move up a, a single atom around a piece of copper, right? With a needle. That's reality. But nobody can see that. None of us can see the atomic level with our eyes. It's too much data, right? You, there's trillions of little atoms sitting on the table in front of you all vibrating. If you could see that, it would drive you insane. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Too much data. So your eyes throw away most of that data, right? If you look at it that way and let you see a table, you don't mm -hmm. see the atomic level. The only way you see atomic level is on a computer screen, mm -hmm. right? When I was at IBM moving the single atom around, I was looking at a computer screen to see reality. <laughs> None of us sees reality. So you're right on point. The headset is going to recreate what you think is reality in digital for you mm. right? and let you do things. Now, once you get the glasses, the glasses are actually letting you see reality at some level, right? Mm -hmm. through, the, through the optic, you're seeing the real world and it's putting virtual stuff on top of the real world or taking away the real world and putting something else there because it still can do, do what the first device can do which is put spongebob in place of my printer over here right take away the printer put spongebob there same thing with the glasses it'll turn off it'll black that out and put spongebob right or it'll turn it into some new world and uh, nerf and put spongebob there um and so that it's going to be quite mind blowing. People who haven't had their hand in a, a Hololens or a Magic Leap, they have no idea what the magic is that's coming. I mean, Hololens has a very small little viewing area, like 40, 40 something degrees, right? And it's very blurry uh, and dim. But even with that, it, you play a game like Fragments. Uh, fragments, um, aliens blow holes in your real walls. Mm. It's mind blowing, right? So you're looking at the wall, and the and the wall is cracking, <laughs> and then an alien pops through the crack, <laughs> and you got to shoot the alien with your finger before the alien gets through the crack, right? <laughs> that's insane, man. And that's with a a shitty device that's heavy and expensive and it has uh, crappy optics, right? All of that is being fixed in the next two three years. I've seen the device, the prototypes already. It's a lightweight pair of glasses blows that away hmm. so what's coming is pretty crazy and and where do you see where, where do you see facebook in in all of this mix um do you think they will play a, a key role in in all of that or how, how do you yeah see that? they're not going away i mean mark zuckerberg mark zuckerberg's strategy is the best strategist in the valley um and so i had never bet against him um he doesn't have the trust. He doesn't have a lot of things. But is he going to be a player in in um, this world, even on an Apple pair of glasses? Absolutely. He has 2 billion users, and he has all the data of Instagram and WhatsApp and Messenger. And So I, I can't see him going away, but change is coming. I don't know what survives of his, right? 
I, I don't know what I use of his in five years. It, there's a real risk that Apple comes in and takes a lot of it away. Hmm. Yeah. Or an open AI or a Tesla. I mean, right. If I buy a Cybertruck in two years, right. And then uh, Tesla comes out in three years with a pair of glasses for the Cybertruck. I'm buying a pair. Mm. Right. Even if they're two grand, I'm buying a pair, period. Because they'll be <laughs> integrated with the car, with the transportation system in a way that Apple or Google or Meta mm. can't. Because he has he has the computer in the car. So you want to talk to the vents and say, hey, Tesla, uh, turn down you know, the AC, make it warmer in here. They could do that with a pair of glasses. Um, Google and Apple are, are never going to get access to the Tesla car that way. Mm. Right? At least not unless they do a deal with Elon. Right? <laughs> you know? And so um, there's games still to be played. I don't know how it all works out. I, I know directionally, but I don't know which brand. I don't know which system. I don't know which kid comes along with something so social that uses all this AI and makes it fun. And all of a sudden, everybody's switching to that. I don't know. And where do you see the Chinese companies in, in all of that? Will they play a big role? They have more data than we do because they have more people. Um, and less, less privacy, right? Yeah. Yeah, they have very different view on privacy. They have the ability to make things very cheaply and pound us into the ground on price on making things. Um, so they're they're not going to go away. They're going to be important. Um, I don't know which one. You know, who will figure out how to make a worldwide brand out of it? Um, you know, if you go around the world, uh, a lot of people will have iPhones, but most people have Android phone, right? Um, usually from a company like Huawei that makes a, a lower cost phone that's very capable. And they're going to be a player. You know, they're spending a lot of money in R&D too. So. Absolutely. And then, I, you know, even if I buy a pair of Apple glasses, right, there's going to be a lot of things to do in those glasses eventually. So is some of those things TikTok kind of thing? Sure. Right. Mm. So. Is China going to keep coming after our marketing channels? Absolutely. Hmm. Wow. So, so much, so much to think about and, and to talk about. Yeah, Robert, I think uh, it's a, it's a good spot to, to wrap it up uh, for, for this talk. Hey, so, thank you so much for, for coming on. It has been a real pleasure to talk to you after such a long time. Thank and you. Uh, I really yeah. value your, your views and, uh, and yeah perspectives on, on things you're really well connected and uh, bring bring a lot of uh, different perspectives to the table i don't so. actually do anything i just look at like, twitter a lot <laughs> <laughs> so you're actually a twitter ai <laughs> you know and easily replaced that, that part of me could be replaced like that you know and by the way if you ask chat gpt about me or about something i did it knows i'm not i asked it I asked it, uh, you know, tell me a story about Mark Zuckerberg and, and uh, Robert Scovel, you know, and it told me a story of when I met him at Davos, right? Because it ingested not just my blogs, but everybody else's blogs, mm. right? So it it has a holistic view of something like that. It's really crazy, you know, what it knows. And um, yeah, it can, it can write, it, you can ask it, hey, write tweets like Snoop Dogg would or write tweets like Robert Scoble would and it does because it studied all of our language right so absolutely what what platforms are you most active these days if people would like to follow you Twitter Twitter I, I Twitter is the real time is the way I, I'm following 45,000 people in the AI space and I can't do that on LinkedIn or Facebook or TikTok or anywhere else so Absolutely, to totally agree. Twitter, Twitter is the place to be, and and obviously YouTube. I, I think Twitter and YouTube are are my two favorites right now. But um, I think if I had to choose, probably yeah, it's 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 dif difficult to choose. But I think these these two are really important, and I'm really looking forward to what Elon will do in the creator space. He seems to now push uh, monetization on on Twitter, so uh, that will be interesting. What uh, what will be possible? So Robert, thanks, for the, thanks thank, for the fun conversation. Yeah, thank you so much and uh talk to you talk to you next time.
And everybody go follow um, Robert on uh, Twitter. I will link uh, to all of his uh, socials, of course, uh, in the description down below. And if you haven't already uh, subscribed to this channel, a lot of you are not subscribed yet. And we'll see each other in the next conversation. Have a great day, everyone.